Hey, Nicole. How's it going? Hey, Red. Good. How are you? Good. Okay. I'm going to have you pronounce your last name because I say it, I say <laughs> Zazowski, but I don't think that's yeah. right. No, that's absolutely is, correct. Is that close enough? Yeah, it's spot on. <laughs> yeah, okay. the S, it's pretty phonetic, but the S is pronounced like a Z. So Zazowski, okay. yeah. Well, thanks for taking the time to be on today. I'm excited to talk to you. I was wondering, how did you, and we'll dive into this a little bit deeper. How did, how did you even come across, come to like Terry Hargrave, the restoration therapy model? Like how, what was your journey to get you to that spot? I'm curious just of the connection because you and I only met face to face just this last year, but right. well, after you know, maybe Pepperdine in passing at sure. the first, in passing so yeah. it was like 2016 but really this last year but i know we've been a part of the same community for a long time so what was your journey to get to this community of rt yeah it was pretty simple and straightforward i went to fuller seminary right after i graduated from undergrad um at pepperdine university and went straight into my graduate work in the marriage and family therapy program at Fuller. Terry had been there one to two years, Terry and so Sharon. Like 2008, you came in about? 2009. Nine, 2009, All okay. of 2009. Uh, so they'd been there a little bit. Um, and, you know, he, he had started teaching certain courses from the RT perspective. Um I think certainly family therapy, and uh, it was one of the models we studied pretty deeply in marital therapy, that class. Right. Um, my husband and I happened to be engaged that first year of my graduate work, and we actually did Sharon's, um, they, had, they had a different name at the time, but it was a Relate Strong group. Yeah. You know, I think it was a nine-week course all from the restoration therapy model. So we were experiencing it in her group with three other couples. And simultaneously, I was learning about it as a, as a marriage and family therapy student. And I just remember, you know, Terry teaches very experientially. Right. Um, lots of demonstration, lots of opportunities for us to try it on ourselves in a role play format. And I just remember thinking, I want to do therapy like that. Like, that's the way I want to learn to see. Um, and that's the way that I want to help other people see and grow. And so I I asked him, I was a pretty bold student. <laughs> I, I, I said, would you be willing to sit with me once a week and train me? Wow. Um, and he's, he's so generous. If you know Dr. Terry Hargrave and his wife, Sharon, you know how generous they are just mm -hmm. with their wisdom, their time. Um, it, And I still remember he handed me a metal cross and he said, it'll make me cry thinking about it. He said, I look at training more like discipleship. And that's really what it's been. I mean, we've met there. We've taken some breaks. You know, I had some babies. There was COVID. He had some family stuff going on with his parents, but um we, so we've taken a few short breaks, but we've basically met together for 13 years. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So mission accomplished. This is the way I see my own life. I, I really try to practice the model in my own life too, with my own marriage. The group was great because I'm not married to a therapist. And so, <laughs> but it gave him such good language so that we can speak a common language about our emotional regulation and what's happening underneath the waterline in our marriage. Um, so I try to practice it in my own life and that's how I see my own pain. And certainly it's, it's the guiding model in my work as a therapist. Yeah. I was curious about that. Cause you know, I, Terry came to Fuller. I graduated in 07 and he came okay. right after. And I didn't, I didn't meet him till I remember a guy coming on campus with a bow tie doing like a, like a, um, what do you call those talks that professors give when they might become on, become on faculty? I remember oh, him being on campus and he was I all dressed the up. Term. Some, yeah. ac some academia term. Right. <laughs> but I met him when I started doing the hideaway intensives in 2010. Okay. 
Steve and Rajan Trafton, who run the hideaway, introduced me to him and Sharon. I met them and had coffee and breakfast with them one morning back in 2010. And I wow. consider him a mentor ever since as well. So we've kind of run parallel tracks, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. And I had a, a brief time at the hideaway. Well, it wasn't brief. It was a few years um, in Atlanta. So I was in a, a different location than you. Yeah. And you, you're probably the envy of us therapists anyways, because you you are one of the only students I know who actually wrote a book with Terry as well. Oh, that was... Family, families and Forgiveness, so... I privilege and joy. Yes, I did that one and um, got to be a contributor to restoration therapy <laughs> techniques. Well, tell me a little bit about, I know we jumped right into it, but I'm going to back up a little bit again. Walk us through just a little bit of your journey to becoming a therapist. Mm -hmm. And we won't dive into it much, you know, but you're the author of of two great books, um, From Lost to Found and What If It's Wonderful. And, you know, so maybe say something about those and how they play into your work as a therapist. And then from there, I'd like to dive into some other things with you in terms of specifically anxiety. Sure. So my journey to become a therapist, uh, happened my sophomore year of college uh, at Pepperdine. You study abroad. Most, I think 70% of students are are gone for their entire sophomore year. So what that looked like for me was uh, being in Heidelberg, Germany with 50 other students living in one house and the faculty family who happened to be with us, living with us and teaching that year uh, happened to be the head of the psychology department. And she was just observing how much I loved being a resource for other students, how other students seemed to come to me with different angsts they were having. And I never saw it as, um, you know, something that could be a sign of my vocation. I just really enjoyed those deeper conversations, helping people work through the growth that we were all going through at that time. And at the end of the year that, um, uh, faculty member sat me down and said, are you sure you don't want to be a therapist? <laughs> and it was like, it was just one of those moments, not, not the whole of my calling has felt like this, but it was, it was one of those moments where God felt like he just flipped the the lights on. Um, and I never looked back. I switched my major um, and yeah, pursued that from that point on and have really loved it. Have felt very affirmed in that calling uh, the writing, not the academic writing I did with Terry, I, I had always sort of loved, I did a lot of research in college, a lot of um, academic writing. The the books you refer to from Lost to Found and What If It's Wonderful, those were a, a little bit of a surprise to me. <laughs> I didn't anticipate writing um, trade books uh, but what happened was I went through a really, right after I graduated from Fuller, I went through a really difficult season. We moved across the country really suddenly. It was a move I needed, but it was not a move I wanted. <laughs> um, I felt extremely displaced. Um, we encountered a really painful season of multiple miscarriages and in, in very, a few very short years. So there was just this chronic loss um, that I couldn't, I had no control over. Um, and we might get into this later, but that was my anxiety kind of uh, spiked at that point. Um, and I realized that I wasn't practicing and leaning on the truth that I knew to be true for my clients. I was doing that RT work with my clients. I believed in the model yeah. And I wasn't applying it to myself. Um, and so it was a journey of practicing and trusting the work that I was doing with other people in my own life. And then I started writing about that, sharing about it, realizing this is resonating with people that have very different stories than mine, but the core is the same. The meaning is the same. Um and by the grace of God, that led to some publishing opportunities. And so I have that arm of my work as well, where I combine my personal story, my therapy work, and um, some faith uh, elements in that writing as well. 
Yeah, and you do, besides doing your practice and writing, it seems like you do a lot of workshops and teaching. I do. Well, which you enjoy a lot. Yeah, I do some some trainings, um, workshops, and you know, women's retreats for churches and things like that. Yeah, you know, we've we've used the word RT or restoration therapy, and I think so. You're like, I guess, since two thousand eight. 16 years into this journey with RT or 15 years. Mm -hmm. I'm about 14 years into it. It seems like we both feel like we're constantly learning. We don't have it figured out. No. <laughs> Fine. Restoration therapy is a model for someone that are listening who'd like, okay, what's this restoration therapy? Like how might you put language around it? You know, as, as Terry would say, we do a few things. <laughs> we, we, um, identify what what you and I would call the pain cycle, which is how we tend to feel and behaviors we tend to lean on and cope with that are totally understandable, but not very helpful. Um, so really identifying, you know, 90% of the time when you're in pain, what do you feel and what do you tend to do? And that's largely based on not so much what you're going through currently, but the the story that you bring to that current moment. Um, and then, you know, a lot of models would stop there and say that insight is enough to, to know, to do something different. One of the things I like about RT is that they have a map for the truth and, and what it looks like when we are at peace and connected with one another. And so the, the second thing we do is to get, to identify that, what we call that peace cycle, which is what even though those feelings are real, what is the truth I'm going to claim about mm -hmm. my identity and sense of safety about that feeling? Um, and then if that is true, I may not feel it. I may even struggle to believe it. <laughs> but if I'm going to claim that that is true, how will I live differently? How will I turn from that reactive way? And what behaviors am I going to employ that are self-nurturing, nurturing to other people, um, you know, present and engaged, um, and, you know, have a balance of give and take. So identify the pain cycle, identify the peace cycle, and then really practice when, when we are triggered, moving from that pain to the peace and then living that out, really practicing what that looks like. So it's not rocket science. Terry would tell you that Sharon would tell you that. Um, but it is a very, very powerful model. Um, if somebody is willing to practice it. Yeah. I think the practice, I think like what drew me to it was, was that specifically that practice component that yes. it's, not, it's not enough, right? Like you said, to have insight about our lives, but how do we take that insight and literally put it into practice in our day-to-day -day life? And, um, Sometimes when I mention practicing in my office, people are like, what are you, you know, what are you talking about? What do you mean uh -huh. practice stuff? And so, and I know at the hideaway when I used to, we would leave a marriage intensive and, you know, there's stories floating around, you know, that months later, someone might call the hideaway and be like, you know, things aren't going well. We came to right. the hideaway. And the question to them is, have you been practicing? And they're like, what do you mean? What are practicing what? You know, yeah. the pain and peace cycle, the four steps. So I think it's human, maybe it's human nature. We don't, maybe we just stop at insight quite a bit and don't do the practice component. And I'm wondering why yeah. that is maybe, do you think, what is it about the practice piece that is so difficult for us? I think a few reasons it's, and I I'll raise my hand here for myself in my own life too. It's hard to change. I have a lot of compassion on my clients. You know, if we think about the fact that the brain prefers what it knows yeah. and not necessarily what is good or true, then practicing something different where we have to claim this truth that, again, we may not feel yet and then make a choice that's different than what our brain is most used to choosing that's hard work. I mean, it's, it's like, why, why do you not practice piano when you have p lessons once a week? <laughs> why do you not like, it's, it's tough work. It's really hard work to practice, but more than that, the brain prefers what it knows. So you're not, 
you're not even practicing on neutral ground. You're, you're fighting against what's most familiar. Now, the more you practice, the more familiar the truth becomes, the more familiar that new behavior comes. Yeah. And then that becomes what the brain prefers. But getting there is, is not for the faint of heart. Um, another reason is I think we're hoping on some level that somebody else is going to correct the message that hurts so bad, you know, either the person in our past, those original programmers of that pain um, that told you you weren't good enough or that you could never count on or you felt abandoned by to correct that message and say, I was wrong and here's what I know to be true instead. Or, you know, hoping that a spouse or a significant other is going to come into your life and fix that pain and their love is going to be enough to, to heal that. I think there's a lot of reasons we are hesitant to step up to the plate in our own healing. Yeah, it feels so. I remember the first time I walked through the four steps of my wife and she knew nothing about it. I had just come back from <laughs> marriage intensive and she picked me up at the airport that morning and we okay. got into like, not a conflict, but like in our pattern, I remember I'm like, I'm just going to practice what we're doing all weekend. Yeah. I remember just feeling so exposed and vulnerable to like walk through how you're feeling and how you cope and being able to say your truth and what you're going to do differently and actually try to practice that. That was just, yeah, it just felt so unsafe kind of. It's, it's still hard for me Yeah, More because I think of my pride Yeah, uh, because I got to, you know, it starts with me. If my, if I'm in a place where my pain has gotten hit, what I would love to do is tell my husband what he needs to do differently so I can feel better. <laughs> but I've learned to see that as a sign that, oh, I have to regulate my own pain. And this is a hard thing to do. Um, worth it. And the only way through to the other side, I think. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of models will also work against that message and say, yeah, how can your spouse or how can your friend be different so that you can feel better? Yeah, and it it sounds nice, but it's not very empowering. And so restoration therapy doesn't, doesn't promote self-regulation just to be difficult. It's because we know that's actually the thing that works and practicing it is the best chance you have of not calling your therapist in six months and saying, we're back to square one. Yeah. You know, let's, I was thinking about how we could like take this model and flesh it out into an issue that people are really obviously struggling with today. And that's the topic of anxiety. I know anxiety for you as well for me comes from like our own personal stories. I think that's why we're really passionate about it. Um, Culturally, it seems like everyone's talking about it and writing about it. I know the author, Jonathan Haidt's new book, Anxious Generation, just came out, which people are talking about. Yeah. Um, let's, and, I, and again, I know we're both learners to this, but let's let's see if we can take anxiety and kind of put it within the context of restoration therapy and how we work with people. Um, and I'll start with this. Something Terry taught me, which at least for me at the time was revolutionary with anxiety, is he said, Rhett, you know, anxiety is not a feeling. It's, it's a behavior. It's how we cope. Right. Um, so anxiety, Rhett, is something you do. You become anxious, you do anxiety. And unless we get really to the root of it, like the deeper feelings that's driving it, essentially it's hard, it's hard to heal. Right. Um, and I think that was so I don't know, life-changing for me because in my experience, we often just look at anxiety as a feeling and we just try to manage that behavior or that symptom, whatever we think it is, and never get to the deeper roots. And right. at least for me, RT has helped me go, okay, if someone's anxious, there's something underneath it that we can identify that could help free this person, um, help them understand their anxiety better, maybe get some healing around it. That's, that's for, for me, at least that was a pivotal point. I'm wondering for you, what was a pivotal point in going, okay, RT restoration therapy could be helpful for anxiety. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's certainly one seeing anxiety as a clue 
that I'm either feeling something about my identity or my sense of empowerment as restoration therapists. Those are sort of the two broad directions or two broad categories we put pain into. So it, it might feel like an emotional experience, but it is something we do. It's a behavior. And so that's just a clue to ask yourself, how am I feeling about myself or how am I feeling about the relationship or circumstance? I think another um, turning point for me was just recognizing choice and really heightening choice in, in terms of how we deal with anxiety that we are a lot more empowered to, it's difficult, um, but but we are a lot more empowered to speak something different into that feeling than just waiting for anxiety to pass or, or treating it like something that you wear that's always with you. Um, and maybe that you even identify with. I, I know I'm seeing a lot of that in my practice, like, oh, I have anxiety. Like it's part of your identity yeah. um, rather than being something that you can confront. Now, I want to be careful here. What I'm not saying is if you work hard enough, you can change maybe the circumstance that you're wrestling with or you know, if you had just would have, could have, should have, like you wouldn't be in this place. Anxiety comes from a million different directions. There is a chemical component to some of it. Um, and so I think you and I are more talking about what are the choices we can make to move through this very hard thing with peace? Um, I know for me personally, I mentioned the the fertility journey that my husband and I found ourselves on, that was the first time in my life that I confronted something where it truly didn't matter how hard I worked, mm -hmm. how much I pleased other people, how good of a performance I gave, I couldn't change it. Yeah, And that was the best and worst thing that could ever happen to me. It was extremely painful to realize, oh, I feel really powerless. <laughs> Cause I'm used to being able to outwork this thing and at least get somewhere. Um, and I couldn't. And so my brain went into overdrive trying to control what it can't with anxiety, but to recognize I may not be able to control the situation, but there's a lot of choices. There's a lot of levers I can pull mm -hmm. that will determine how we move through this thing. Um, I'll never forget ever, ever what Terry said to me when I was sharing this, because um, he's also a very close personal mentor, he and his wife both. Um, he said, I know you will be a good steward of your pain. And that's a phrase I use a lot um, because I can't change the pain. I can't eliminate it, but we have a lot of choice in terms of how we move through it. A good line, good steward of your pain. Yeah. <laughs> really powerful for me. Um, yeah. You, I want to back up because you said something that's important and you, you talked about anxiety and uh, really around identity and empowerment. And, mm -hmm. you know, and I, th I think what you're referring to is like in the restoration therapy model, it seems clear in other models too, that our brain is wired around, is it, is it my loved, right? I um, and by love, meaning am I known, wanted, do I have value here? And, and so that's that, our value as a person. Yeah. So that's an identity piece. And then is this safe? Am I safe here? Is this an open, reliable, reliable, reliable consistent balance. environment that, that trust piece. So when you talk about identity and empowerment, is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, and, and either one could result in an anxiety behavior, um, that it's not just, oh, if you feel feelings around your lack of safety, then you'll become anxious. But those are just the two camps that anxiety can grow from. Yeah. So I'll give a personal example and I'd love to kind of maybe hear from you. So like, and that's, again, I think the more I do this work, the more I see the nuances and things expand in my understanding of my own anxiety. You don't, 
I don't think I'll ever have it completely figured out, right? Mm -hmm. Evolves. But I think a lot of my anxiety is rooted in identity. And, and that has to go back to my mom passing away from breast cancer when I was 11. Oh. And the feelings of, um, I'm sorry, in safety, feelings of like her dying, being alone, being being abandoned, right? So there's a there's a violation of my safety um, as a kid. Yeah. And and anything can happen. And but as I've gotten older and had more language, um, because what happened after that is I went back to school a couple of weeks later and I started to stutter and I couldn't like communicate really. Mm -hmm. And then the message to myself was, I'm not good enough. I can't measure up. I'm inadequate in some way because I stutter. Right. So I feel like most of my life, anxiety has been a violation of both my identity, that I don't measure up, that I'm not good enough, that I'm not adequate, and, and a violation of my safety, that the world is not a safe place, that someone could die, you could be abandoned, you might find yourself alone. And so it feels like almost like a two-pronged yes. pack some ways. And I think, I don't know, I'm just kind of speaking this out loud. Um, understanding that has been really helpful for me because to move forward, the work has been both, like you said, to empower myself um, around safety and, and choices and advocacy, but also around my own sense of identity and that I am adequate, that I do measure up, that I have value and worth. And and that gets, even just talking about it can get complicated, you know? And so like working with people and helping them understand that, um, okay. I have found RT to be very helpful in kind of parsing out the different complexities of anxiety that we might encounter. Right. And, and I think Terry would say there's a lot of overlap, like you, you are not alone in terms of a lot of people having sort of a combination right. of identity and safety pain, um, that, that has led them to become anxious. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I would say similar for me, uh, for sure have that feeling of when I get up to do a presentation, having to remind myself that my identity will remain unchanged no matter how this goes. Um, mm -hmm. And I might still feel butterflies in my stomach, but not, but taking my identity off the line um, that, that my value as a person is not going to be determined by this moment would wow. be an identity pain versus the example I gave earlier, which is, you know, feeling totally powerless um, to to guide my life. Do you think you've ever held on to anxiety kind of as a, you're like, it's become the narrative that you're comfortable with then and like, Oh, a hundred percent. What's the benefit of that? Is it just because it's comfortable? It's what you know. And so you're used to, even if it's, dysfunctional or unhelpful, it, it, at least, you know, the contours of it. Yeah. I think where I've noticed that recently, just personally for myself, and I do see it with a lot of the adolescents that I work with as well, um, that stress and anxiety have become so fused with hard work for me uh -huh. that, um, I'm working on a, a writing project currently and I've had many moments where I'm like, am I working hard enough on this? Because I'm I'm more at peace than I was writing my other two trade books. <laughs> and so you would think like, wow, aren't you just embracing that new way of living? Like, but I will feel a tremendous amount of anxiety when I go to bed, you know, before midnight or um, the fact that I'm not stressed to the point where I will ask my husband, a, like an, a question out of my anxiety, to like, because maybe that would mean I'm giving this project my all. Yeah. I don't need to do that. Um, and I notice I mentioned adolescence. I, I notice that there can be a hesitancy to let go of some of those anxious behaviors or anxious ruminating thoughts because we were convinced that's the difference maker for us. Like mm -hmm. 
this is what it looks like to give it my all, or this is who I am during finals week, or this is just the way I do things. No, it's not helping them at all. They, their gifting and their hard work is what gets them to where they're going, but it's not the the anxiety, but that's become so fused with it. You have to be taking care of yourself, but then the miss taking care of yourself questioning. Is, yeah. Yeah. The self-nurture is like so uncomfortable for me. Yeah. Even if it's just being kind to myself as I work hard or having a trust that it's going to be okay. Like we're, we're going to get to publication date and somehow, some way we're going to get there. It's like the, the, the worry that accompanies that piece um, is hard to shake. And just how tenaciously, I was talking about this with Terry the other day, those ruminating thoughts are so tenacious. There's a lot of similarities in our brain. I won't go into detail because I don't feel comfortable <laughs> talking about it in terms of, I, I don't know all the details of what happens, but there's a lot of overlap in our brain in terms of what happens with OCD, what happens with addiction, what happens with depression and anxiety and eating disorders. And, and those feel very different on the surface, Yeah. but the, the, the thread that ties them together is how tenacious those ruminating thoughts are and how much work we have to do to confront them. Yeah. You have to like relentlessly. Yeah. I remember in our anxiety intensives training stuff with Terry, you might you talk about have to relentlessly break up the rumination, which yeah. can be exhausting, especially in the beginning, because the rumination could be just like all day long. Yeah. And having to interfere with that daily. It's almost, I always say it's like the, it's like a soundtrack in the, the, the it's like a soundtrack in the back of our mind. That's almost unconscious. It's constantly going. Yeah. That rumination thought and to be able to be aware of it and to break it up. It does. It just takes a lot of work and it can be exhausting at first. Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, it reminds me of some, I'm speak, thinking specifically of some men I was working with in executive coaching and we were dealing with their anger and they didn't want to, they felt like if we man, if we dealt with their anger and like, quote, healed it, it would take their edge away. Yeah. Yeah. In the workplace to be competitive and to have that grinding mentality. And I kind of, it's no different. I get the sense from you that if you took away some of your anxiety, there's like, it, you feel like it might take away this edge you have to yeah. like, perform to achieve to work harder and that's not true but that that's part of the lie that gets embedded not only from the identity and safety pieces that we talked about those lies but the lie of this is serving me in some way the familiarity this has in the brain must must make it a preferred thing and it's i mean you and i know anything we do in our pain blame which would include the anger, shame, control, escape is equally destructive. Um, so we know it's it's not helpful, but it really can do a good job of convincing us it is. What would so let's say someone comes into you and and they're so just in general they're like I'm struggling with anxiety. What how do you begin to flesh that out? And, and let's just use the RT model, for example, as kind of our framework. If someone comes to you initially or someone is listening to this and they're struggling with anxiety, how do you kind of begin that process with someone to, to begin to move towards healing around it? I think the initial step is just understanding what where anxiety is in their pain cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, what What are those underlying messages? that the that behavior grows from whether it's you know i'm not good enough i'm inadequate i can't measure up or i'll be rejected if i'm not perfect to you know a story where there was a lot of unpredictability and their brain responded anxiously because they never knew what they could count on or not um so really understanding where it is in the the pain cycle, but we go, we go to practice pretty quickly. Um, I, I think, you know, 
you and I do a lot of that Huberman breathing where um, it's a breathing technique that's really just physiological sigh. Yes. Yes. Um, I love that term. Double, in, double quick, double inhale, hold, yep. exhale. Yeah. And I am someone who has to do the, the arm raising with it, the, with the double inhale yeah. and um, I'm, but I'm very physical. So it was really helpful for me to move. Yeah, so what do you mean you get to practice pretty quickly? What does that mean in your office? What does that look like? I get people on their feet. Um, like, they get up, stand up. Stand up. Even if we're having the same conversation, there's just something about getting on our feet that can move us emotionally. Um, and then really getting to an alternative message. Understanding is helpful so that you can know what you're talking to. It is, it's not helpful to, as a therapist, perpetuate that rumination by, you know, journaling about the pain or journal. Journaling can be helpful only if it's um, strictly with, with the truth, the answer you want to interrupt that harmful message that, that anxiety tells you. So you would, in terms of journaling, it would be okay to identify the pain, but it needs to come along with an identifying truth, not just pain, 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 page after page after page is what you're right. saying. Right. Like I, and, and I might not even, of course, yes, identify the pain, but when it comes to journaling, I might not actually have them journal anything except the truth that yeah. answers that. Um I mean, you and I were at a training together in the fall and I was the the quote unquote client in the exercise. And Terry did this exercise with me and a few other people where I had to sort of say, no, no, Terry was saying the messages from anxiety about, and it was mostly identity focused for me. Yeah. Um, and I had to, I had to interrupt that and, and answer back. That was hard work. <laughs> it was, it was yeah. really easy to just let that play. So I think as therapists, we, uh, we underestimate the amount of work and the amount of practice it takes to, to interrupt, to stop, interrupt, turn those, um, destructive messages that anxiety wants to give us and then do something different. Um, because the more we let that play, what, what would Terry say? You have how many seconds to, to interrupt? It oh, wasn't, it's not, no, I mean, probably a few seconds. I mean, yeah, I mean, less than 10, I think to, to, to interrupt that message before it becomes a lot harder to uproot. Yeah. Um, I always, for whatever reason, I don't think this was from him, but I, I picture a tick bite, like you, you have a limited amount of time to get that tick off of you before it's a lot harder to get it out. The East Coast um, speaking now. Yes. Yes. You could tell I'm from, I'm near well, yeah. London, Connecticut. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I, yeah. Cause um, yeah, it's just so insidious, like the way it works in our lives that we if, yeah, if we don't interrupt it quickly, it's just going to be an autopilot, I think, simmering and ruminating in the background. Oh, it definitely will. And, and I think we as therapists have to be disciplined, especially because we love story. We love understanding all the nuance of how that message came to be and how it got planted in our hearts. And we have to be disciplined about getting just enough information to then move forward. Mm -hmm. and and help them like once you have that destructive message you have what you need um yeah. we don't necessarily need all the stories that contributed to that or all the dynamics um i'm just i'm very biased here i'm just gonna say it out loud yeah and lots of other trainings other other therapeutic models right um i've i've never my rt training with terry has prepared me to understand pain and patterns so quick and to see them yep I almost take it for granted versus I, I guess what I'm saying there's a there's a lot of stuff in the therapy world where I don't think they do a very good job of assessing mm -mm. people 
people's patterns and dynamics and the pain stuff, they do really well at maybe staying in the pain forever and getting lots of stories. And, yeah. you know, I, I tell clients that come to my office, like, um, you know, it, and of course, initial session, I want to kind of hear what's going on, but I'm not going to sit and go after, go for over the next 10 sessions over every detail. No. <laughs> that, that, yeah. that stuff will emerge as needed. Yes. There might be a time, session, right. There might be at session 10, they say what we're talking about, or as I'm yeah. As I'm standing here, I'm realizing what who I'm actually speaking to is my third grade teacher, or you know, and then that story becomes a lot more powerful than you know, chronologically walking through at the beginning just every uh detail. Um, and I I agree, I think restoration therapy is very efficient. Yeah. And under and comprehensive. So efficient and comprehensive and understanding your pain and, and what you tend to do with it and, and then helps you do actually do something different with it. Yeah. I'd imagine it's part training from the model. It's part, obviously experience of years of doing the work. And it's, I think, ongoing training that you and I do with the RT community that helps us continue to learn new things and get better at things that we, I wasn't as good at before. But if you're listening to someone's story, they're already, it seems like in the first few minutes, giving you the language. Yep. You're like, that's the pain cycle right there. They've already said it in the first two minutes. And so you're saying, once you hear that, what's you're up and practicing. Um. Well, first Maybe I would- Not that quick, but like pretty right. quick. I get it on paper. I'd show it to them. You yeah. know, here, here are the, the feelings about your identity and sense of safety that I'm- that I'm hearing as you talk. Yeah. And then here are the things that I am understanding that you do when you're in pain that again, is understandable as I listen to your story, you know, those things don't appear in a vacuum, um, but they're destructive to yourself and they're destructive to your relationships. Um, and I would have them confirmed. So there's some buy-in like, yep, that's me when I'm in pain. And usually that's pretty quick. Yeah. Um, like they just recognize themselves so quickly on that piece of paper. There might be a tweak or two, or maybe they prefer one word over another, like not good enough over inadequate or something like that. But um, if you've listened well with, with this framework in mind and tracked and chased their pain, it's probably going to be pretty accurate. Um, They're anxious, talking about anxiety. You're getting under the surface, identifying that pain yeah. point that, that triggers their anxiety as a coping behavior. And, yeah. you know, the hard part, it's one thing to intellectually get it, but to, to kind of concrete have it in you and to practice it, to move to that truth piece. What what have you been found helpful in your own life or in the people that you work with to really like identify the truth? I have That's almost never, question. yeah, yeah. I've almost never done that, not done that experientially. Yeah. Um, that might look like a reparenting exercise if they've told me a really powerful story from their past. Um that almost played like a movie as they told it, I will go, I will remember that and go back there. Um, I might ask them if I don't have a story, you know, tell me about the first time or the, the most memorable time you felt this in your life. And even then we're, they're usually not sitting passively on my couch. You know, we're, we're moving our bodies. I'm having them show me what it feels like if I, if I asked you to tell me what this feels like without using words, how, how would you show me with your body? Mm. You know, sometimes that looks like, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, sometimes that looks like moving into the future, the experiential piece where we imagine what life looks like when they're stronger, wiser and, and better in the way that they want to be better. Um, and you know, we get experiential in that way. Um, sometimes I'll play with the five senses to really make that picture powerful. So what do you, 
see? What do you hear? What do you smell? What do you taste? And what do you feel? Um, so there's all sorts of things. Sometimes I will have it be like an externalizing conversation. Like if you're a therapist who's listening, like an empty chair kind of situation where you have your pain and your truth talk to each other essentially. And, and that's empowering because the person can realize, oh, I hear this other voice, but I have a choice in whether I agree with that and I can talk back to it. So all sorts of ways, but usually experiential. What if someone, and this could be yourself included, because I'm sure you've experienced this. What if you're like, I just don't believe this truth, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like, how do you, do you encourage them just to keep moving into the practice, even though it hasn't moved? Like I would say from the head to the heart, maybe like intellectually, they know like I'm adequate or I can make good choices, but they don't really believe it. Like, how do you, and I, I get it that you probably do that experientially. Is it just, is that something that comes with practice that becomes more embedded in who we are, that truth piece? Or is there something else that you do to help people move through that? It does. It does come through practice, but I have changed my language around it. And this is good news and bad news. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the bad news is it's really fun when we feel like doing something and then do it out of out of that feeling. Um, unfortunately, the brain just most of the time does not work that way. We can think and act our way to a new feeling, but we can't just feel our way to the change we hope we to see in our lives. And so the comforting part, the good news is it I'll kind of say it doesn't matter. Um I want you, what truth are you going to claim? I love that word claim because we don't have to feel it. Of course we don't. We've spent years believing this other thing and our feelings are attached to that belief. So, but, but we have a choice in terms of what message we are going to continue to tell ourselves moving forward. So what truth are you going to claim um, rather than have to... Oh yeah, no, this is awesome. I love it. <laughs> Rather that? than have to feel, <laughs> um, my daughter just visited me. Um, so, so what truth are you are you going to claim about that? Are you going to continue to say that about yourself, or are you going to choose something different? And what it really heightens is the responsibility and the choice we have, and and not our passivity as clients where we just hope that we feel something different. So it's okay. What I hear you saying, it's okay if I'm struggling to claim that truth, but I can keep practicing that and moving in directions and making choices, even though I'm struggling to claim that fully, you know what I'm saying? It doesn't always feel good. It's not this always victorious. I got this figured out, but there's a wrestling and a struggling, I think from what I'm hearing to claim that truth, but the more we do that, the more we practice it, the more we lay down new tracks within our neural network. Maybe, I don't want to say easier becomes, maybe it comes easier over time, but we obviously have off times too. I mean, does that sound? Yeah, I think we can have, and and when you do those experiential exercises, I think there there's often a moment where you really connect and yes, I, I do believe that about myself or this is what I want to tell my child version of myself that was hurting. And we have to make the choice in our everyday lives to continue to claim that as true, whether we believe it or feel it or not. If I were to, how many times a day do you think you think about or literally walk through your four steps? Mm, depends on the day. Right. Uh, Cause I, I, I bet it's a lot. That's my point. Yeah. I mean, North of 10. <laughs> I mean, um, and if I, if I really remembered, can I just shut my door? Oh, you do what you gotta do. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm going to shut my door. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That'll be better for your, sorry. <laughs> oh, this is a, this is a family friendly podcast. <laughs> 
talk to uh, him, so. my daughter is I'm hanging on to her nap and sometimes that goes longer on on some days than I others but you know when you gotta think get oh, no, no. What, wrap no, up this is time. great um so you just might hear some noise um this is part of you know <laughs> <laughs> life as a therapist um yeah so I I have to walk through my four steps many, many times a day. Um, and I'm going to say I should probably do it more than I do. Yeah, I, I think, especially days when I'm in the therapy office, mm -hmm. no joke, I, I bet I'm thinking about parts of it, pain and peace cycle, mm -hmm. over a hundred times, right? Probably just yep. coming and going. Now, now, literally either walking through the four steps out loud or in my head at an office or home, for like you, north of 10, maybe more. And I guess I just want to say it out loud because the point is it takes a lot of practice. Oh goodness. Yes. And, and we've had this language for almost 15 years. Yeah. Um, and my brain is liking it better, but it's still hard when I'm in pain, those ruts are so deep to feel that feeling and do that thing. I know I shouldn't do like, lean into my anxiety, um, instead of fight it. Um, it's, it's really hard work. So if you're listening and thinking this feels impossible, it's not impossible, but it is, it is a good workout. <laughs> so let's say, and we can make up, you know, you can just make this imaginary, but let's say a client comes into you and you've helped them identify their pain around anxiety and their truth and stuff. And you've been working with them. How would you indicate, or maybe how would they indicate that they are, I don't know, that they're healing, that they're moving in the right direction? Like, what's a sign of growth for someone who struggles with anxiety? Hmm. Anxiety specifically. Yeah. And I know it's broad, right? Because this could manifest in many different ways. But you could you could narrow it down to maybe a specific action, even of like an adolescent, you know, that you have in right. mind. I think whatever that new action is, that they're able to more consistently choose that in between our sessions. Yeah. Um, obviously, I'm not following them around between sessions. I'm not a part of their everyday life, so I'm not able to necessarily observe that, but I hear the stories and I hear the way they tell me the stories. Like, this is really starting to make a difference for me. Yeah. Or, or feeling so proud that, no, it wasn't easy, but I chose the better thing. I, I did not go the anxious direction. I, I chose to, you know, instead of shut down, I, I connected with a friend and asked them how they're doing and how I can be thinking or, or praying for them today. You know, they, they were able to do something because often anxiety kind of pulls us inward toward ourselves where there's a lot of navel gazing in terms of our own experience. So when a client is able to have that feeling, but also then reach out and turn outward and nurture someone else, I, I would see that as a huge progress. And again, the anxiety didn't go away. They just did something different with it. Yeah. So let's just, I mean, randomly, I'm just thinking like, let's say a 50, you're working with a 15 year old girl who it's clear her pain cycle is around just not measuring up in her circle of friends, feeling inadequate, right? Constantly mm -hmm. measuring herself, whether it's her performance or how she looks. And let's say that's exacerbated by social media you know, and so you're, <laughs> so you're working with yeah. her, you've identified the pain, you've identified the truth, her moving into some different actions where, excuse me, she's able to what, to, to hold more firm to her sense of self and identity that she does measure up, that maybe she's less, um, prone to getting in anxious activities, like scrolling constantly. Like, I'm just kind of thinking out loud what that might look like. So I have this client that's coming to mind and, and fits yeah. that description pretty well. And her, her truth and new behaviors is kind of twofold. Um, she asks herself, what would a person who knows she's valuable do in this uh, moment? Yeah. So she's taken the truth. And she said, 
and there's that claiming language, not what would a valuable person do, what would a person who knows she's valuable do? So she's, I may not feel it, but I'm going to claim that as true. And for her often, the anxious ruminating behavior uh, turns into double texting. And what I mean by that is you send someone a text and you're anxious waiting there for their reply. So you text them again. And it's hard on her relationships because it can come across as badgering or um, impatient um, and not connecting at all when you're on the receiving end of all these anxious text messages. Um, and so she does not double text. She puts her phone down. Sometimes she turns her phone off. Um, sometimes she puts it in a different room. Sometimes she sends a text to a different friend, encouraging them, but it's an opposing behavior to what she would typically do. And here's like, this is a difference I think between, I'm not saying RT is the only model, but this difference between RT and a lot of models and also maybe the type of therapist you are is that success would be for a lot of people, this girl goes out and she's not double texting, but maybe they never healed the inner deeper stuff around her sense of identity. But in your work around her identity that she does measure up, that that she has a strong sense of self, that's what enables her to to calm that anxious behavior of double texting. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. No, this is assuming we've done that healing work. She's yeah. had she's had a moment of no, I do agree with that. Like that okay. that is what I am going to claim. And so in those painful moments when she's tempted to forget that part of her or forget to believe the truth, okay, here's what I've identified and I'm calling on that person in this moment to make my choices. Um, but yes, this is, this is more the practice phase, which again does happen early. Um, yeah. but this is assuming we've identified that truth around her value. Yeah. Cause I think a lot of, you know, I think a, lo a lot of times we just, we look at the symptom, we try to fix that symptom. Right. We see all the anxiety people are struggling with and we we give them tools to try to fix it and to manage that symptom. And that may work for a while, but what I've found in my own life and the people I work with, which I'm sure you have a too, unless you get to the deeper root and heal those issues around identity and empowerment, um, it's, it's hard to make traction long-term towards healing and new types of behaviors. Right, right. You have, it has to be rooted in something. And it has to be rooted in the truth about who you are and or your empowerment and safety in the world. Let's, um, we'll wrap up here in a few minutes, but I want to ask you outside of like restoration therapy and maybe a part of it, what are your like top two or three go-to like tools or practices with somebody who's struggling with anxiety, like things that they can do on their own that maybe they do during the week? that you encourage them to employ? What are some things that you found to be really helpful around this? I mean, they're, they're practices that I learned within the context of restoration therapy training, but, um, you know, aren't specific to yeah. the pain cycle and peace cycle. Um, a lot of bilateral stimulation. Um, so that's just crossing the midline of the brain. Yeah. Um, exercises like uh, getting a huge piece of paper or ideally a, a chalkboard um, and, and getting something with some drag on it, like a crayon or, you know, chalk on a chalkboard, how it's not like a smooth pen or a dry erase marker and doing like a sideways figure eight, like the infinity sign. So going for people who are listening across your body, across that yep. kind of midsection of the prefrontal cortex, right? Left, yep. left. You're crossing the midline of the brain and it's like a massage or a, a drink of water for the brain, um, tossing a, a ball or a hacky sack back and forth between your hands. So again, the ball is crossing that midline. Even um, I'll tell kids who are stuck in class, like crossing their arms under their desk and tapping um, their knees, you know, with, with your opposing arm, <laughs> hard to describe when you can't no. see um, you know, and, and 
we would call that similar to the the breathing, the physiological sigh that we referred to earlier with the two short inhales and the long exhale. Those are off ramps. Sometimes we can't talk to our brain when it's it's like screaming down the highway at 90 miles an hour and telling yourself to to pull a U-turn on the highway. That's obviously impossible and and not safe. Your brain can't do that sometimes when it's so anxious, it, it can't hear the truth, even if we know it. So some of those bilateral stimulation exercises or that physiological sigh is, is what we call an off-ramp. It doesn't solve the problem. We're not talking, we're not speaking truth to that pain but it gets us to a place where, where our brain can hear us mm -hmm. and, and interact with us. Um, so those are a few things I've added, you know, to the process um, that aren't necessarily pain and peace cycle specific, but yeah. you know, we well, as our T therapist practice. Obviously that bilateral stimulation is a huge component of like EMDR work. Mm -hmm. Right. But there's lots of things outside of like having to be EMDR or ETT or other type of train that we can do, like you said, on our own, passing the ball, like you said, across the, our body. I know in EMDR, they do this, they cross their arms and they tap the yeah. opposing shoulders, like they call it the butterfly method. Okay. Um, so there's something about that. Like you said, you have your kids put underneath their desk, cross their arm. Yeah. Arm, yeah. Their um, so the breathing is big, the bilateral stimulation, uh, just any type of body movement, it sounds like is really- Yeah, helpful. I'll have them. Up. Yeah, sculpting, which again is, you know, from a, a foundational model in marriage and family therapy, but something we definitely use in RT where you're, you're showing, you're moving between the pain and what it looks like to be at peace, you know, just with your body and, and having- that physiological expression of emotional regulation. Um, like, what does it look like to really move into this new place? And why wouldn't I choose this? Because this feels so much better. <laughs> well, yeah. And I have a lot of feeling, a lot of people who listen to this will want to come work with you probably in Connecticut. Oh. <laughs> well, you'll have to come to Connecticut right now, right? Or have you That's come out for a workshop or something? That's right. Well, likewise, my friend, you are a, a gifted therapist and I love getting to collaborate with you. You know, the more I do therapy and the more I do training with other therapists like you and the Hargraves and that group of people, I realize, I realize how much more I, I need to continue to grow, you know? Oh, it's, it's, I think that's part of the point though. I think yeah, it is. We, we as therapists need to be growing and I feel the same way uh, when I go to a training, like, wow, I got a lot of work to do. And hopefully we always feel that way. My, my talk about anxiety, kicking up, putting my pain cycle, it's like <laughs> it's watching some of these gifted therapists work. And I'm like, wow, oh, yeah. that's intense. So um, if people want to look more at your work, you know, connect with you. What, what in your, is the best place to go? Is it your website? Is it, and I'm going to put links in the show notes. Is it Instagram? What do you recommend to people? Yeah, I, um, I love connecting with readers and listeners. So Instagram is a great, uh, place to have a conversation with me and get to see a lot of what I do. I'm just at Nicole Zazowski. Um, my website's another good place. It'll be undergoing some construction soon, but it's it'll be there. It's NicoleZazowski.com. And then my books, again, are from Lost to Found and What If It's Wonderful. And the new project you're working on. Yes, yes. There will be a Bible study coming next year. Super exciting. Yeah. Well, hey, I appreciate you taking the time. It's good to see your daughter for a brief second. <laughs> oh, <yeah>. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Yeah, yeah. Great to see you. Thank you. Have a good day. Okay. Thanks. You too. Bye.